Well, good morning. It's such a delight to uh, be back with you. And on behalf of our colleagues uh, at Christ Community Church, my pastoral colleagues and uh, congregation, uh, we just want to say thank you. Uh, some of you are aware that I have the privilege of serving on the board. And um, I'd ask you to pray for our presidential search process. Um, and continue, we lift you up in prayer as a staff and as a faculty and as a student body. So thank you again on behalf of our congregation. Uh, thank you for the joy of partnering with you. And I want to give you an invitation. Some of you have been uh, at Christ Community at different occasions, teaching, preaching. Um, but uh, you're always welcome. And when you're in Kansas City, uh, come by and uh, we'll uh, give you some good barbecue. How's that? Well, I'm not a big time yard jock, but I must admit that I like doing lawn work. Uh, that is, until recently when the wind was sort of knocked out of my sails this past fall. I'd been traveling and my grass had been growing. And uh, I had a quick moment to mow the grass in my backyard, so I was really cruising. I was rushing, pushing that lawn mower. And frankly, it happened so fast, <laughs> I couldn't stop it. The momentum of my revved up lawnmower devoured my extended sprinkler head hidden in the grass. At this agonizing moment, words snuck out of my, let's just say, non reverend mouth that I won't repeat for you this morning. Not because I want to guard you from the pretentious veil of my piety, but I want to save my pastoral position. Work, sometimes, it makes me want to curse. How about you? Whether it is at home, in a classroom, on a factory floor, in an office, work could be one big pain. Most of us have had the experience as a student facing that urgent deadline, and having the computer crash, or that printer jam. That is an amazing big time pain. Some of us deal with difficult customers or parishioners, uh, or we serve under a demanding dean, I mean a boss. That's not easy either, is it? It's a big pain. Or in our days, having to let an employee or staff go or to downsize a labor force, that is a brutal pain. Or facing a family's mountain, literally mountain of dirty laundry, is a big pain. Work, it sometimes makes us want to curse. But why? Why is this? Why is work often such a pain? Well, I'd like you to turn with me to Genesis 3 as we examine a text that has been read already this morning. Let me just say that work raises many questions, our vocation. And the Bible gives us a framework in which to place it but it does not answer all the questions that emerge in the deep viscera of our hearts and souls. Television commercials and ads, we've all seen them, and they hawk all kinds of wares from cosmetics, plastic surgery, and they give us this contrasting before and after picture. And they sell a lot of stuff with that contrast. Well, it seems to me, in a way, the biblical writers, the biblical narrative of Genesis in particular, paint a before and after picture, a literary picture that tells a story of riveting contrast. The first three chapters of the Bible, we are given this contrast of before and after picture of work. And so in our last time together on Tuesday, we looked a little bit, a glimpse at the before picture in Genesis 1 and 2. And what we saw in the before picture of Genesis 1 and 2 is that God designed human work to be not a frustrating pain, but he designed it to be an intimate relationship with him, an intimate relationship with others, and an exhilarating pleasure that wove it together, a fabric of joy. But now as we come to Genesis 3, most of us are aware that we see the after picture, and it's not a pretty picture. It's a picture of humankind's tragic fall into sin and death, and the consequences, the devastating consequences, like a rivet, riveting Stone on a pond goes out through all of culture, all of reality, and permeates in a devastating whammo in work itself. Paradise is lost. The Genesis narrative tells us that while work is not the result of the curse, work itself is so profoundly impacted by the curse in every dimension. The biblical writers tell us that 
Our work, my work, your work, whatever it is, is not now what it ought to be. In this fallen and broken world, God's original design for work has been so badly corrupted, and we ask the question, so what happened? So let's look again at Genesis 3 at a very seminal text, verses 17 through 19. This is God's word. Then to Adam God said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. And you will eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now when you follow this narrative, you notice that this word curse has already occurred in the narrative. Like he did earlier with the serpent, here in verse 17, the biblical writer employs the word curse to describe this new reality, its massive and devastating effects on work. In our contemporary cultural context, when we hear the word curse, often many things are conjured up into our minds. We often think of sort of a mystical hocus-pocus, a kind of a cultist, witch doctor voodoo sort of thing, pricking pins and hoping something happens. Or casting spells, kind of like being from Kansas, the wicked witch of the West in the Wizard of Oz. Now, I don't want to minimize the real presence and power of Satan, of evil and demons in occultic practice. But when we come into the Genesis text, that is not primarily what is being portrayed here. What does this word curse mean? You will notice the Genesis writer's emphasis, his almost exertion, in describing the far-reaching and long-lasting and deeply agonizing effects of the fall on work. Notice verse 17, 18, and 19, they just build. You feel it as you read it. The very nature and context of human work has so fundamentally been altered by sin. And as you read these verses, as you enter into them in an indwelling posture, you can almost hear the intensity of a hurricane force wind that has transformed the entire landscape of human existence. The groaning of creation. And you feel the weariness as work is placed under a heavy weight. A weight that humans were never originally designed to bear. Work is now toilsome and difficult. We see this later on in the text, this language of Noah, the one who would bring rest, who is not the ultimate one who will bring rest and peace. And you hear it, in Genesis 6, the sense of thorns and thistles and toil and sweat. C.S. Lewis, as he often does, I think, brilliantly captures the essence of the curse. Most of us have either seen the movie or have read his classic, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I think he captures what the curse means in his wonderful way of writing. He describes the mythical Narnia. And he describes it as once displaying this flourishing and vibrancy, this warmth, this penetrating warmth of a sunny summer. But now it faces under the curse a chilling cold of winter. Lucy questions Mr. Tumnus in the interchange about the white witch, if you recall, whose curse had so dreadfully altered the land of Narnia. There's a marvelous little interchange impregnated with such rich truth and theology. Mr. Tumnus responds, Why, it is she that has got Narnia under her thumb. It is she that makes it always winter. And then Lewis's brilliant flair that sticks to our minds and hearts, always winter and never Christmas. Think of that. And Lucy blurts out, you recall, how dreadfully awful. <laughs> always Christmas, or always winter, never Christmas. A great picture for us who are up to our eyeballs in snow in Chicago at the moment. Awful indeed. Evil, sin, and death enter the world with such a ravishing effect on all of creation. We dare to contemplate it. 
In a sense, it is always winter and never Christmas. There is alienation from God. There is alienation from other human beings and community. And yes, there is alienation from work itself. Theologian Mirzlaf Wolf writes beautifully, or he says, God's curse after the fall expresses the fact that an alienation is inherent to the human experience of work. We are broken people who live and work and toil together in a badly broken world. Work, God's word declares, is not what it ought to be. The Apostle Paul who is very familiar with this text, in his brilliant letter to the Romans in chapter 8, I think, echoes the truth of this text. In verses 23 through 34, you remember, along with the cursed and fallen creation, there is this sense of groaning. All creation groans, a visceral groaning in the depths of our being, one that permeates every aspect of work that I like to call sort of a 3D impact. Our work has become difficult, it's become distorted, it's become disillusioning. Work is often painfully difficult. Sin enters the world, it corrupts God's design, it makes work harder. The systems, the structures, the technologies, the economies, the power structures reflect the curse. And we see it every day, don't we? We face difficult people in the workplace. And if we are transparent, some of those difficult people are us, right? We're one of them. We face difficult competition. We face jobs that are less than desirable. One of the things that's astounded me lately is the increasing popularity of a show on television of Discovery Channel. Maybe there are hidden fans here this morning. It is entitled Dirty Jobs. Yeah? The host is Mike Rowe, who has made a fortune and I become a household name, getting his hands dirty and doing these icky, dirty jobs that nobody wants, from rattlesnake catching to septic tank cleaning. That spawns my imagination. And on his popular website, he has um, hope for those who are stuck in dead-end jobs and want to consider a new line of work. So if you're looking for a job, if you're ready to throw in the towel, work is a pain, let me suggest a couple, he suggests, on his list. First of all, it's the roadkill collector. And it uh, lists like this. Must be able to work long hours braving oncoming traffic while picking up creatures of various sizes and breed in various states of decay. <laughs> Benefits include working outdoors. And then there's this little phrase, strong stomach, a real plus. Yeah? The truth that work is difficult and some work is downright nasty, stinky, and dirty has made this show a rating success. Because people know work is often a big pain. But work is often badly distorted. When you look at the scriptures and you look at the world around you, humankind's fall into sin is not only affecting our relationship, but work itself. And what you see is that work can be distorted in three basic ways in our world. First, work can be seen as no big deal. We see this, and that's the destructive danger of slothfulness. We see the book of Proverbs highlighting the danger of sloth, of sluggardliness, of a lack of diligence. And the Apostle Paul, who so strongly makes the statement to the Thessalonians, he who is unwilling to work, neither let him eat. But work on the other side, on the flip side, can also be too big of a deal. We see the destructive danger of workaholism in our culture, where our identity is centered in and our entire life revolves around what we do. And in this common form of idolatry, we worship our work, we live as if God did not exist, that we are self-important, self-autonomous, self-providing, and this can also be driven by our pursuit of the American dream, of material comforts, of greed, of financial security, or to prop up a certain image to others. Excessive devotion to work is one of the most difficult realities that hinder our spiritual life and formation that I know of today. It destroys our relationship with God and our relationship with others and community. In this parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, Jesus warned in very powerful ways of the peril of a life of workaholism, a life lived without God, one that worshipped self, work, and personal comfort. 
Workaholism in all its forms is devastating to families, to the church, to society. And what we see in our lives and we see in Scripture in many places is when work gets out of whack, we can be assured that life, culture, society, financial structures get out of whack too. But work can also be seen through a very wrong lens. The lens that some work is more important than other work. I see this rampant in people's lives today. This destructive danger we might call a kind of insidious work dualism. Dualism simply means on its lower shelf level we wrongly divide something that should not be divided or we wrongly distinguish one thing from another or we we sort of value one thing more at the expense of another. In a very insightful book, Your Work Matters to God, Bill Hendricks and Doug Sherman describe so well this distorted picture of work and they describe it as a two-story work world. The upper story, they say, is a higher calling. It's seen as a higher calling. It's up here, one devoted, of course, to church or religious or sacred work. And then there's a lower calling for the hoi polloi, right? A lower story, which is secular work. This work dualism is so dangerous because it's so subtle and it sounds so pious and so spiritual. But it is faulty thinking when we compare it to the biblical text. Work dualism can be seen seeping in many Christian traditions. For example, in my particular more pietistic tradition, we often use the language full-time Christian work. Well, what we usually mean or communicate to others is the vocational calling of pastors or missionaries or parachurch workers. And these are very important callings. Don't misunderstand me. And people in our congregation describe me as someone who is sort of paid to be good kind of work. I'll never forget soon after I became a pastor when a dear lady came up to me after a worship service and she expressed to me in a kind way her appreciation for the morning message and how it touched her heart. And then she looked at me and she said, young man, and I loved that at that day, when did you receive your call? Um, Those moments of pastoral politeness and temperament need to be brought to the surface. And by God's grace, I did not say what I thought. It was very kind. But what did she mean? I wanted to say, when did you receive your call, lady? Underlying her words is this insidious distortion about work and vocation. This distortion in many other traditions, and it's seeping in some of evangelical traditions today, is seen in an increased monastic impulse. Followers of Jesus are increasingly beckoned to withdraw from the normal day-to-day world to pursue a highly spiritual and a highly mystical contemplative life. A call to sort of leave the common day-to-day life, to find God in some deeper way, or experience God's presence in some more saturated or concentrated way. In perpetuating this distortion, there is often, not always, but often a reinforcement of a false two-story work world. One that elevates certain vocations over others and reinforces the idea of withdrawing from the world rather than engaging in it. Now, my calling as a pastor, though I am paid to be good, I'm often reminded of that, is no more or less full-time Christian work than any lay person. Our mission field is right where God has called us to work, to study, or to volunteer for the common good. Dorothy Sayers is onto something, I think, when she rightly says the only Christian work is good work well done. As we begin to grasp a more robust theology of work and vocation, I believe we must avoid these subtle distortions of slothfulness or workaholism or religious dualism that are rampant in the church today. We must understand that because of humankind's fall, work has become difficult. It is distorted. We see it through a a strange lens, a distorted lens. And work itself, no matter what we are called to, can become disillusioning over time. That's why I guess I love the writer of Ecclesiastes, who gives me a hopeful realism of life, who guards me against utopian triumphalism, a sense of sort of Pollyanna worlds, that there is much in our current world that creates disillusionment. It is as if he has before him the lyrics of the great Rolling Stones classic song. 
I can't get no satisfaction, but I try and I try and I try. So written thousands of years ago, it is one of the best books I have read on work. Ecclesiastes 2, 22 through 23, I love this text. The writer says, For what does a man get in all his labor and in his striving with which he labors under the sun? Because all his days, you know, just feel the weight, his task is painful and grievous. Even at night, his mind will or does not, in your translation, rest. This, too, is vanity. Though our work is often difficult, we feel its disillusionment, its lack of satisfaction. We must also realize that in it there is still this residual creation imprint. That work is a very good thing. It is a gift of God. And the writer of Ecclesiastes touches this as well, does he not? Chapter 3, 12 to 13, he says, I know there is nothing better for them to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. It is the gift of God. Oh, I need to remember that. The writer of Ecclesiastes reminds us that work in this broken and fallen world is how we might say a mixed bag. It has a curse, but it also has a true gift at its creation core. Miroslav Volf, again, I think, has written beautifully here. He summarizes the before and after picture of work, both the gift and the curse of the work. And he writes, together, Genesis 2.15 and Genesis 3.17 and following affirm that the inescapable reality of human sin makes work, listen how he says it, unavoidably an ambiguous reality. Isn't that great? phraseology. He writes, it is both a noble expression of human creation in the image of God and a painful testimony to human estrangement from God. So, how do we begin to cultivate what I like to describe as a hopeful realism about work? Let me suggest three things perhaps jot down to tuck into your mind and heart as you leave this morning. First, remain hopeful in the midst of work's inevitable difficulties. How I need to be reminded of that. This morning, you may be facing some intense pressures, some very real difficulties, even as you leave here. And as a pastor, I not only make it a point to visit the workplaces of our congregation members, but boy, do I hear from them. Not long ago, I received an email from a fine corporate gentleman who describes his vocation in the high-tech business competitive global corporation that he's a part of, and he describes it this way. He says, quote, It's like I'm a daily private Ryan. I hit the beach, the landing gear goes down, and the bullets are flying. People next to you are dropping or getting hit while you scramble up the beach to accomplish your individual mission without getting hit, hopefully. He says, morale suffers under the carnage. Wow. I also received an email from a member of our congregation who is presently a stay-at-home mom who's grasping the rich, robust theology of vocation. She writes this word, and, and, and she writes it so well. She's such a brilliant person. She says, as a stay-at-home mom, I don't get a lot of accolades or affirmation. No paycheck. No glowing review from my boss. I have been working through these thoughts and feelings, and she says, several weeks ago, I decided I wasn't going to spend any more time feeling like a victim. She goes on to describe the transformation of her work. She says, I have never thought of being a mother as an act of sacred and holy worship. I can look at it in a whole new way now, exclamation point. She says, I can now see the contributions that I make to my household as what I was uniquely created to do for this season of life. Our work can be very difficult. We can be in places we just don't think are part of God's providential plan, even though we think providence is an important doctrine. But we do not have to live 
in the often melancholy Eeyore fog of disappointment and discouragement. If we grasp the truth of God's word about our work, we can remain hopefully buoyant even in the toughest economy in how long? In very difficult job circumstances, and they are brutal out there, as you know. I love Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of James 1, 2 through 3. I wrap it around my soul often. He writes, consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Do you hear what he's saying? Like the station of marriage or work or other vocational realities, God calls us to is one of God's main conduits to bring us to increasing maturity in Christ, increasing sanctification, increasing spiritual formation, and the way to accomplish God's redemptive mission in the world. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, said this. He said, God's complete work is set in motion through vocation. Second truth that I've sort of been tucking in my heart lately is this. See your work as an opportunity for personal growth and influence. I have to tell you, as I look back at my vocational work, I realize that some of the greatest personal and leadership growth lessons I have ever learned have been in those excruciating crucibles of pain and suffering in those difficult days. And when my work is most demanding in the last couple weeks have been extraordinarily demanding, that is when my pastoral inadequacy, my physical exhaustion, is inescapable before my eyes. And God visits me at that moment with wisdom and strength, and I grow as a human being and trust in him in ways I never experienced before. Romans chapter 5, you know this text. After the Apostle Paul articulates this transformational truth of the gospel of Jesus, that we find new creation in life by faith alone in Christ alone, he lays out this marvelous path of our ongoing transformation. It is not a path of ease, but one of enduring hope, Paul describes in verses 3 through 5 these words. And not only in this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been dumped, poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The workplace is often God's main conduit for our transformation and our missional thrust in the world. It is where proven character and hope and Christ-likeness is forged. In it, we are called to be salt and light. And when we understand the rich truths of vocation, we realize that Christ in our apprenticeship with him, wants us to fully engage in the work he has called us to. Healthy spiritual growth is not primarily about withdrawing from the world, but engaging in it. For he has made us for the street as luminaries of his grace and as redemptive agents in a broken and needy world. It is not a path merely of spiritual contemplation, incarnational gospel mission and bold gospel proclamation. God's word clearly reminds us that in this very broken world with broken people, my work, your work, our work, Trinity's work as a whole will never be all that it was intended to be. Though sin entered the world, the good news is so did the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to this sin-stained world and died and shed his precious blood on a cruel Roman cross. The Redeemer, not only of our human souls, but also a precious and broken, fallen creation. Without knowing Christ, without cultivating that relational intimacy in his yoke, 
life is not only deeply unfulfilling, but our work is also unfulfilling. The Bible reminds us that the before and after picture of Genesis 3 is not the last picture of work. I'm so glad for that. As the good news story ends, this brilliant and enticing and enrapturing imaginative picture emerges in the Holy Scriptures. The end of the Bible and Revelation, this revelation of Jesus and his glorious future with him, there is a picture of new creation. of a brand new heavens and a new earth. Shortly before Jesus made his way to the cross, he spoke not of the before picture of Genesis 1 and 2 or even the after picture of Genesis 3, but primarily he spoke of the last picture. And he left his disciples as he gathered them around him with these hopeful words that John leaves for us. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you for I go to prepare a place for you. Rudyard Kipling profoundly captures this in a beautiful poem entitled, When Earth's Last Picture is Painted. Kipling says, When Earth's last picture is painted and the tubes are twisted and dried, when the oldest colors have faded and the youngest critic has died, we shall rest and faith, we shall need it. Lie down for an eon or two till the master of all good workmen shall put us to work anew. And no one will work for the money. No one will work for the fame. But each for the joy of working, and each in his separate star, will draw the thing as he sees it, for the God of things as they are. Let's pray. Almighty triune God, by whose will we were created, whose gracious providence we are sustained, grant to us your gracious blessings these days. You have given to each of us our work in life, and Lord, enable us to diligently perform our respective duties. May we not waste our time in unprofitableness or idleness, nor be unfaithful to any trust you have committed to us. And by your grace, strengthen each of us for the performance of the duties before us and the stations you have called us to indwell. In Jesus' name, the name above every name we pray. Amen. Shalom.